Tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Uh, the people are scared. I think it's a good thing. Cancelled. Air Canada suspends flights to Beijing and Shanghai also. This could have been a routine sudden death, but what followed was a 15-month investigation. Criminal charges against a caregiver and the society that hired her after a woman with a developmental disability died in their care. And... I think the outcry will be horrific uh, from the people with disabilities, from the disabled community. Passengers with disabilities caught in the middle of the battle between taxis and ride-hailing companies. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. A rising death toll, coronavirus cases growing rapidly tonight in China. The virus has killed 170 people there, and there are now more than 7,700 cases. And tonight, Air Canada is suspending all flights to Beijing and Shanghai. Dan Burritt, live at YBR again tonight. So, Dan, why is Air Canada suspending service? Well, much like other airlines, Mike and Anita, they're doing so because they are seeing a lower demand for air travel into China. And now the government of Canada has issued a warning to people to essentially avoid non-essential travel to China. Now, Air Canada normally runs 33 flights a week to China from here in Vancouver, Toronto, as well as Montreal. It canceled a few flights yesterday, but as you mentioned today, it has scrubbed those flights to Shanghai and Beijing, the capital, and that will start tomorrow and run until the end of February at least. Affected customers will be able to book on another flight if another flight is available or Air Canada says they can get refunds. We spoke to some passengers getting off a of flight from Air Canada from China arriving here at YVR today. One of the last, many say they are relieved. Take a listen. Kind of a scary situation there. You don't know what what's going really going on there. I work in Beijing at a school and we were shut down indefinitely until uh, uh, things kind of clear up there. So I kind of four o'clock booked the next ticket out, which is at 6.30 th uh, that day. So uh, quickly got to the airport. Luckily, it's not too far and I uh, was able to get. So I had no idea. So thankfully, I, I got on it. Lucky me, I can come home on time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel very re released because in China, everybody is so scared now. And but but we are all, most of us are really safe because uh, we mostly stayed at home and having the self-isolation. And Dan, Ottawa is chartering a plane to bring Canadian citizens home from China. How soon can we expect that to happen? Foreign Affairs says that could take several days. They have to do some diplomatic work since the region that's affected where these Canadians are in Wuhan is essentially locked down. Ottawa says about 160 Canadians have asked for consular help so far, but not all of them want to leave China. We have spoken with a couple who is in Wuhan right now. They are locked down. The uh, woman there in that, in that relationship is about a month from giving birth. They say they have not heard anything official about getting on that flight to get Canadians out, and they only heard about this from friends. Honestly, it's about time. <laughs> Um, it's, you know, they're, they're definitely behind the, you know, other countries. So they've got some catching up to do. I'm glad that they've finally made that decision. Um, I, I think it is the right one. You know, there are a lot of people here who all have, you know, stories of why they're here or why they need to get back. Keep this in mind though, Dr. Teresa Tam, Canada's chief public health officer says, Chinese authorities will not allow anybody to get on that plane if they suspect they may be infected with coronavirus. They say that's just a precaution. Anita, Mike. All right, Dan Burrett, live at YBR tonight. Thanks. And as infection rates climb in China, experts say the risk here in B.C. is still low. But that hasn't stopped a flood of questions about the infectious disease. Arlie and Young spoke with B.C.'s top doctor to get you the answers. Here are your most asked questions about novel coronavirus. How do I protect myself and my family? Clean your hands regularly. Washing your hands is the, one of the best ways we can to protect ourselves from anything. Cover your mouth when you cough or cough into your elbow. 
and stay home and stay away from others if you're sick yourself. Should I be wearing a mask? Is it even helpful? There's not any evidence that if you're not ill, wearing a mask, particularly wearing a mask outside or out in public, provides much protection or any benefit at all. If you are sick, however, uh, wearing a mask can cover up your secretion so that you're not um, exposing others and, and it can protect others. How do you become infected with coronavirus? Does that mean I should avoid public areas? So this is a respiratory virus. So that means it's transmitted to people through droplets that come from things like sputum, saliva, when you cough or sneeze, and sometimes even when you talk. But you have to be really close to somebody to inhale those particles, those little bits of, of water with that contain virus into your lungs. So the only way we get infected is if we inhale the virus into our lungs, deep into our lungs. So you can't be um, infected for the most part from casual contact or from contact outside. And sometimes people who cough or sneeze who have the virus, those droplets can last for a number of hours on a, on a surface like a table or something. So that's why it's really important to clean high touch surfaces regularly. Are you contagious even if you don't show any symptoms? There seems to be conflicting advice. We do know that in uh, Wuhan city in particular in those areas of China where there is a lot of people ill and a lot of transmission going on, there may be some transmission from people who have milder symptoms. And as younger people are getting infected and particularly children who don't seem to get very severe illness with this and they may be passing it on. What we have not seen though is anybody who is not showing any symptoms passing it on to somebody else. There have been one case report in a family where, where a child um, didn't seem to have any symptoms and was positive for the virus but we don't know if that child ever transmitted it to anybody else. So the risk if it is any at all from somebody who's not having any symptoms is extremely low and we don't seem that think that that's a worry for transmission. Who is most at risk from this virus? What we're seeing from China is that this, this virus is probably not causing as severe illness in most people as some of the other coronaviruses, particularly SARS and MERS, and it is most um, causing the most severe illness in people who are older and the initial cases it was certainly over 65 and mostly male but also people who have had underlying illnesses so for the most part if you're young and healthy your chances of having a severe illness with this virus are much much less and we'll have more on the coronavirus situation both here at home and in China later on in the show and on the efforts to repatriate Canadians in Hubei province. Charges have been laid in the death of a 54-year-old woman with a severe developmental disability. Both the caregiver and the society that hired her have now been criminally charged. The victim was found dead in October of 2018 in the Port Coquitlam home of her caregiver where she'd been living. The results of the police investigation were that the necessaries of life had not been provided to the 54-year-old who lost her life. When we talk about necessaries of life, we mean food, shelter, appropriate medical care, and protection from harm. The Kinsight Society says it was shocked and saddened when it learned of the woman's death, and in a statement today, it said, it's the first time in the history of our organization that the death of an individual receiving our services has been the subject of a police investigation and criminal charges. And we are confident that all care and safety provisions for those we serve are being met. Concerned tonight after more three more women have reported sex assaults in the Glen Park area of Coquitlam. That brings the total number of victims of alleged sex assaults in the area to seven. RCMP say the attacker targets women who are walking alone. He usually comes up from behind before hitting them or grabbing them and then running away. Witnesses report he has a slight build, is short or below average height, and was wearing dark clothes and a black jacket. It is called a fairness office, and the provincial government is hoping it'll increase accountability and transparency at ICBC. The office will be required to report to the public in plain language on the type and number of issues it has heard, along with recommendations it has made to ICBC. 
ICBC in turn will be required to report publicly on actions it takes to respond to these recommendations. Now, individual ICBC payout decisions will still need to be disputed in small claims court, but the Fairness Office will deal with people who feel they've been treated unfairly by a policy or by an adjuster. ICBC will also be required to produce a customer-friendly summary of its annual report so people can see exactly how their premium dollars are being spent. A man who has admitted to killing two strangers in their South Vancouver home in 2017 says violent video games influenced his attack. Defence lawyers for Rocky Rambo Wei Nam Cam played a series of violent video game clips that appeared to mimic elements of the random attack. Yesterday, he admitted in B.C. Supreme Court to attacking Richard Jones and Diana Ma Jones. Cam's lawyer plans to argue his client was suffering from a mental disorder and he thought he was in a video game at the time of the killings. Cam is facing two charges of first-degree murder. Well, the ongoing spat between the city of Surrey and Uber is reaching a new level tonight. The ride-hailing company is now seeking a court injunction to try to prevent the city from issuing tickets to Uber drivers. It's a direct response to Mayor Doug McCallum's doubled-down promise to fine Uber drivers $500 a day for operating in Surrey. Over the weekend, bylaw officers issued 18 warning tickets during what the mayor called a grace period, but Uber isn't backing down. The city of Surrey's actions are unfair to residents who want to earn money and to those who need a safe, affordable, reliable ride. I am hopeful that the city will immediately cease issuing illegal fines. As for the province, it says municipalities don't have the right to ban ride hailing, but the Premier has no plans to step in at this point. And adding another layer to how ride hailing has caused a shift in the passenger transportation industry, the Vancouver Taxi Association says wheelchair accessible vans will no longer be given priority. It says Uber and Lyft have made business too competitive and its taxi drivers want to switch to smaller cars, which are less expensive to buy, maintain and insure. Advocates say this leaves those with disabilities caught in the crossfire. It would be great uh, if basically immediately uh, the Vancouver Taxi Association and the other taxi companies could uh, have uh, meetings with the province uh, and the Passenger Transportation Board to figure out a way how they can all work together to meet the needs of our vulnerable uh, members of society. We need to have a certain number of wheelchair accessible vans available to our users. McEnroth says her community relies on taxis over other services like HandyDart because they offer spontaneity and freedom. The push to extend SkyTrain to UBC is picking up. The city of Vancouver, UBC and First Nations are joining forces to pressure the province and Ottawa for the $3.8 billion line. Slaywatooth Chief Leah George Wilson says the partnership is an important step in reconciliation. Almost a year ago, Metro Vancouver Mayor's Council on Regional Transportation voted in favor of extending SkyTrain service. Building the Broadway subway to Arbuta Street is an amazing start, but all of us here today and right across the region know that we can't stop there. Right now, the University's Point Grey campus is connected by the 99B line, and that B line is the busiest bus route in Canada and the United States every day. More than 60,000 people catch a ride on the route. A report from the Mayor's Council says the SkyTrain is the only option that can provide sufficient capacity to meet demand on that route beyond 2045. About a dozen demonstrators who were arrested last Tuesday inside a provincial government office building are now filing complaints with the BC Complaints Commission. The group was protesting the construction of a natural gas pipeline against the wishes of the Wet'suwet'en First Nation hereditary chiefs in the area. The activists say the demonstrators were denied food and multiple protesters sustained injuries during the arrests. Victoria police are defending their actions. Police say they did everything in their power to resolve the incident safely without any arrests. Just a little technical difficulty there. The Union of BC Indian Chiefs is supporting demonstrators, saying the response of the police toward peaceful Indigenous youth is concerning. The Police Complaints Commission now says 
It has received several complaints about the use of force by Victoria Police during the demonstration. Well, White Rock is a community known for its quaint seaside promenade. The yeah, affluent enclave is far from the exposed poverty of Vancouver's downtown east side or the homeless camps of Maple Ridge or Abbotsford. But as Rafferty Baker reports, as part of our Treading Water series, White Rock is struggling with homelessness too. The iconic pier, the seaside, the boardwalk. The White Rock imagery is one of comfort, wealth and leisure. It can seem a world away from the grinding homelessness you see in other parts of Metro Vancouver. Well, the reality is, of course, there is affluence here, just like any other community, but we do have an underbelly of people that are disadvantaged. It's not visible. When the area's extreme weather shelter is open, its 25 beds are often filled or close to it. People are sleeping under their bridges. People are sleeping behind the Tim Hortons. Help is communication. That's what this workshop is all about finding solutions to homelessness on the peninsula. There are church groups here, local politicians, nonprofits, police, and regular members of the public. Safety of all kinds. It's sort of a two-hour jam session, people hashing out the challenges, looking for fresh ideas and leadership. Although it's a fairly well-to-do community, there's also a lot of people that are homeless in our community, and we need to look at that, and we need to try to find ways of creating affordable housing. Walker says as the community grows and property is redeveloped, it's becoming harder for people to afford. He says he's looking to get available land, developers, nonprofits, and other levels of government all together to build new affordable housing within a year's time. We want to see shovels in the ground. For some advocates and volunteers who have worked hard to improve things for homeless people, the perception that White Rock is affluent has been one of the hurdles to overcome here. And people working on this say there can be an undertone of nimbyism. Together we can work to create a community that appreciates and understands this kind of diversity. Everyone is interested in safety and security. This workshop is being hosted in a church. It's a church that manages the extreme weather shelter, renting the space from another church. You know, the, for the churches to be hosting this shelter is crazy. Um, it needs to be in a public building. McMurtry said there's help from BC Housing, but the faith-based groups have carried the burden. And while she's frustrated, it's workshops like this one that give her hope. Rafferty Baker, CBC News, Surrey. Okay, I didn't see a lot of sunshine here in downtown Vancouver today, but I'm hearing in Fraser South, Valley, yeah. and yeah, there was quite a bit of sun poking through, eh, Brett? Yes, there was, and I think it was a bit to my chagrin as well. People down in White Rock, we were just mentioning, in Ladner saw some sunshine, and Vancouver Island as well, plenty to be seen in and around Victoria. I wanted to start off by showing you a look at our current temperatures across the country, because we're getting to this time of year where the rest of the country really does look a little bit more enviously upon provinces like BC, and occasionally Alberta with our mild temperatures that we're seeing. Out in the east, we're seeing temperatures into the minus double digits, and yes, there are a few hours ahead ahead, but certainly the bulk of the cold air in the country is into the east. Now today, once again, the warmest spot in the entire country was in BC, and this time the honor goes to Victoria International Airport. 12.3 degrees, that is a full 5 degrees above normal for this time of year. And if we look at our current temperatures right now, certainly Victoria's cooled down a little bit, down to about 5, but in general, lots of 8s and 9s in and around the region. And you know what you notice probably? It's also a little bit dry for once there isn't really much going on on my radar imagery right now. We saw those showers earlier on this morning, but there is going to be a nice little break. And if you start the clock now, you should probably be getting about 18 hours of dry conditions. You can see that for the overnight period, temperatures will be going down to about 5 degrees or so. Tomorrow morning, starting off dry, but then into the afternoon and evening, we're going to be getting into showers, and that'll be some heavy rain through Friday. All right. Talk to you again in a bit. Thanks, Brett. Sounds good. Okay, some big news involving Burnaby's Christine St. Clair to share with you now. Yes, she has just cemented her place as one of the world's top athletes with a record-breaking performance in an Olympic qualifier. Here's Leon. St. Clair's in the middle of the field. Christine St. Clair! She just broke the record! 185 career goals! Christine St. Clair! She's humble. She's a leader. She's a legend. With the
Olympic gold Sinclair becomes the top international scorer of all time, male or female. She tied the record earlier in the game on a penalty kick. At age 36, she's preparing for her fourth Olympic Games later this year in Tokyo. Amazing accomplishment. Awesome accomplishment. That's incredible. Yes, for yeah. sure. Well, just a reminder, you can watch this newscast live on CBC Gem. The free app is also where you can find other CBC programs. CBC Vancouver also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. And when you watch our show online, you have the added bonus, of course, of watching without any commercials. The state impeachment hearings for Donald Trump get uh, more heated today, but the big question is, Will further witnesses be called? That latest from Washington next. And thanks for joining us online tonight, where we are commercial free during the television break. Tonight brings us part three of five in the CBC series, Made to Last. Whereas the last two featured artisans in dying industries, Robin Canham shows us how book binding is making a resurgence. Bookbinding or bookmaking is 10% um, knowing what to do and 90% knowing what to do when it goes wrong. I think that creating something yourself, having your mark, being able to see your mark in that item is really a satisfying thing. So a lot of the books I make are personal to me in that they document trips or vacations and things like that that I've taken or um, they document kind of things in my life that I value or uh, that I want to remember for a really long time. If it wasn't for the community, I definitely wouldn't be where I am today either um, in terms of my knowledge and my skills. Um, People will go away to workshops and things like that, but whenever they come back, you know, they're, we're all very open to sharing that new knowledge that has been, um, you know, gained. I think traditionally, too, bookbinding was um, a skill that was, you know, you would be an apprentice for a number of years. It really is one of those areas where you can come in with a background in another art or craft and really be able to use that um, to create your own unique book. A lot of the books still around, they're 500, 600 years old or older, you know. Um, it's definitely a form that has, um, has not gone away um, in terms of what what humanity values. Um, of course, when books were first made, um, they were so expensive to produce in terms of the materials and the time um, that would have went into creating them. They kind of became these um, real treasures, you know, and I think that that uh, mentality or that kind of thought on books has continued to this day as well. So in terms of handmade books now, I, I feel like a lot of, a lot of people would treasure, treasure that type of thing. Not sure what will become of them once I'm gone, of course, but just kind of knowing that they'll long outlast me for sure, for sure, is, um, is kind of a surreal feeling. I don't think I have the patience to do that, but pretty cool. I wish that I could patience required. do my own book binding. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm not very artsy. All right, stay with us. Back in just a second with the latest on the Trump impeachment news. Well, U.S. President Donald Trump's impeachment trial continued today with a question and answer period. As Allison Northcott shows us, senators ask questions for and against the U.S. president's removal from office. The Senate will convene as a court of impeachment. This is the next phase of the impeachment trial. I send a question to the desk. After Trump's lawyers wrapped up their defense yesterday, questions today from Republican and Democratic senators. Is there any way for the Senate to render a fully informed verdict in this case without hearing the testimony of Bolton, Mulvaney, 
and the other key eyewitnesses or without seeing the relevant documentary evidence. That is a big one from the Democrats. They want to hear from John Bolton, Trump's former national security advisor, who in an unpublished manuscript reportedly appears to back up the main case the Democrats are making against Trump, that he tried to pressure Ukraine into investigating a political rival. The short answer to that question is no. Uh, there's no way to have a fair trial without witnesses. If you have any question about whether it was a factor, the factor, a quarter of the factor, all of the factor, there is a witness, a subpoena away, who can answer that question. The Democrats want to win over enough moderate Republican senators to win the vote to call witnesses. But most Republican senators don't want new testimony. And today, White House lawyers argued Democrats had their chance to subpoena Bolton during their investigation, but didn't. And that adding witnesses and documents now will only serve to slow things down. And there'd be depositions, and this would drag on for months. And then that's the new precedent. Then that's the way all impeachments operate in the future. The House doesn't have to do the work. They do it quick, they throw it over the transom, and this institution gets derailed and has to deal with it. There is another day of questions tomorrow, and the vote on whether to call witnesses is expected on Friday. Allison Northcott, CBC News, Washington. Nearby on the south lawn of the White House, Donald Trump signed the new NAFTA agreement into law today. So where is the Canadian folks? Where are they? You guys did a good job on us before this deal, I'll tell you. That's, Canada was very tough, but they're good. The U.S. president says the deal is a victory for American workers. It allows American dairy and wheat producers access to the Canadian market. Now, Canada is only one of the three countries involved that has not yet ratified the agreement, but that process started today when Deputy Prime Minister Christian Freeland tabled the deal's implementation bill. European lawmakers have approved Britain's departure from the European Union. Members of the European Parliament then stood, held hands, and sang Old Lang Syne to mark the occasion. The vote was 621 to 49 in favor of an exit deal formulated by British Prime Minister Boris Johnson and EU leaders last fall. During the debate that preceded today's vote, lawmakers cautioned Britain against seeking too many concessions in a new trade deal. Negotiations will start March 3rd. The United Kingdom joined the EU in 1973 and will leave the Union on Friday night. An independent panel is recommending changes to the way we regulate TV, radio, and online services. Eli Glasner reports the panel is calling for a renewed push for Canadian content and new ideas about how to pay for it. For years, many in the telecommunications and broadcasting sector said it was time to update the Broadcasting Act, written before the Internet became such a big part of our daily lives. The CRTC and federal government agreed and commissioned a panel. Now the report is out and the authors are not holding back recommending dramatic changes. But panel chair Janet Yale says homegrown content shouldn't be drowned in the new digital age. As Canadians, we also expect that there will always be a place for Canadian voices and perspectives. To bring the regulations in line with our connected age, the authors recommend foreign streaming services such as Netflix be compelled to contribute part of their programming budget to Canadian shows. But Yale says the investments shouldn't raise subscription rates. Look, <laughs> they spend a lot of money domestically and globally producing uh, content. And we're not, it's not necessarily the case that this is going to increase their program budgets. What we're saying is that the, a portion of those program budgets, which are significant, must be, uh, must qualify as Canadian. So we do not think that this is something that would be passed on to consumers or result in higher prices. The report also has a lot to say about adjusting Canadian content rules for the age of the algorithm. If the main way you watch is to surf the Netflix homepage, Canadian shows might not appear. But the report suggests forcing streamers to ensure Canadian content is visible and easy to find. In its submission to the panel, Netflix described such practices as anti-consumer and said as a media provider who doesn't draw from Canadian content creation funds, it shouldn't be obligated to contribute. 
The panel also had much to say about the CBC itself, suggesting the public broadcaster be totally funded by the government and drop all advertising in five years. The authors of the report also encouraged the government to bring internet access to all Canadians and suggest the federal government provide broadband access in areas where private companies won't. All in all, the report envisions a new, more expansive role for the CRTC and changes to the bedrock of the Canadian film and TV industry. While the Liberal government has promised to deliver a new bill within a year, asked about whether it's realistic considering the ambitious changes, the Minister of Heritage had this to say. Let's talk about this at the end of this year and we'll see how much we will have been able to achieve, but we have the firm intention to deliver uh, on our commitment to table a bill uh, to, to modernize the Broadcasting Act this year. And with Ottawa playing host to the primetime conference of TV and filmmakers, the recommended changes are sure to be the talk of the town. Eli Glaster, CBC News, Ottawa. The death toll and numbers of infections continue to rise in China tonight. Now Canada is arranging to bring Canadians trapped in Hubei province back. How we'll do it next.
Let's take you back to our top story tonight now on CBC Vancouver News. But the people are scared. I think it's a good thing, you know, prevent the virus <laughs> transfer <laughs> from there to here. Air Canada is suspending all flights to Beijing and Shanghai. The airline normally has 33 flights a week to those cities out of Vancouver, Toronto and Montreal. But passenger demand has dropped significantly since the coronavirus outbreak. And the coronavirus death toll has now gone up to 170 people with nearly 8,000 other confirmed cases. New numbers from China's National Health Commission also show an additional 12,000 suspected cases. Foreign governments, including Canada, are working to pull their citizens out of the affected area. Cases of coronavirus have also been detected in 15 other countries, including Australia, Germany, Japan, the United States, and of course here in Canada. But while the virus is undoubtedly spreading, fewer new confirmed cases and deaths were recorded today. That's compared to yesterday. And a presumed case in this province has now been confirmed by the BC CDC. There are two confirmed cases in Ontario as well. But there are also Canadians stuck in the country at the center of the spread. David Cochran has more on the government's efforts to safely bring them home. We have secured a plane to repatriate uh, Canadians. Getting the plane was the easy part. Getting it into China and getting people home will be harder. We need to work with the Chinese authorities with respect to the authorizations you need to bring the plane, obviously in China, but also work on the logistics. Those logistics are challenging. Most Canadians are under quarantine in Wuhan. But others are spread across Hubei province where travel is forbidden or heavily restricted with highways and airports closed. Honestly, it's about time. <laughs> um, it's, you know, they're, they're definitely behind the, you know, other countries. So they've got some catching up to do. I'm glad that they finally made that decision. Lauren Williams is 35 weeks pregnant and stranded in Wuhan with her husband Tom and two-year-old son James. Tom is a British citizen. They've been asking both countries for help. At this stage, it's whichever one takes off first and will take us, will go on. There are endless complications compounded by the fact that Canada has no diplomatic staff in the affected region. So this has to be managed from Beijing, Shanghai and Ottawa. And that's just the beginning. The details of that is being worked out. However, the Chinese authority will not let anyone who might be infected on the plane. We're working very closely with our U.S. counterparts who obviously have some experience in this and have uh, set up some best practices. One of those practices is a voluntary quarantine at a military base, something Canada hasn't ruled out. So what we're looking at is a scenario where we have all the measures in place to protect Canadians um, from exposure to the virus. And having said that, that's about as far as I can go. At least for now, it's the early stages of a complex plan with stranded Canadians desperate for help. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. And as we told you earlier, Air Canada is suspending all flights to and from Beijing and Shanghai after government warnings to avoid travel to mainland China. And it's not just travel. This outbreak is hurting trade, consumer goods. As Peter Armstrong tells us, companies big and small are starting to feel the pinch. You need not look far to see the economic consequences of this virus. Airline after airline suspending flights to China. This afternoon, one of Air Canada's last direct flights from Beijing landed in Vancouver. Like me, I can come home on time. I work in Beijing at a school and we were shut down indefinitely until uh, uh, things kind of clear up there. So I kind of four o'clock booked the next ticket out. In China, entire swaths of the country have been shut down. Starbucks has closed more than half its outlets. Toyota announced it will close its plants, and Google says it will temporarily close all of its Chinese offices. What we really have tried to do is look at what would a SARS-like pandemic today mean for Canada. The fallout from SARS is a decent economic model. Remember, though, back in 2003, China was basically the world's factory. Today, China's much more intertwined in the buying and selling of the global economy. 
the fact that the Chinese authorities have clamped down and they've put um, many cities in lockdown already, that means those consumers are, aren't out there purchasing and that will really dampen Chinese growth. And that dampening will be felt in places you may not expect. Cameron Seafood sells about half its lobsters to China. And Chinese New Year is one of the busiest times of year. They were set to ship about 20,000 pounds this week. Those orders all cancelled. So actually the sales to China completely uh, disappeared from Monday. There are other markets for those lobsters, but there's no way to make up the loss of the Chinese market. And no way of knowing how or when the world's second biggest economy will reopen for business. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. You are looking at a live shot of BC Place at 639 on this Wednesday evening. Expect a bit of a break from the rain lasting into tomorrow afternoon, but don't you worry, that system will return. Another round of showers in store. Brett's here with the full forecast coming up. The weather update is brought to you by The Body Shop that always takes you back to your happy place. BC's favorite, Craftsman Collision, Air Miles, and Bigger Smiles. You walked up here in the commercial break <laughs> and you had that, that look on your face. Yes. Like, oh, what, the rain look? The bearer <laughs> of bad news. The, it's exactly what it is because it's not going to be great for those that haven't been enjoying the rain because we've been seeing a fairly rainy month so far, we know this, but mm -hmm. the last day of the month on Friday, that is probably going to be the rainiest day of the entire month. And I say that without exaggeration. I want to show you these details, but first, let's take a look at what this morning was like just to get you maybe prepped for more of that rain coming late week. Yeah, let's, let's reminisce on this. Certainly we haven't seen enough of that already this month. Always adding to our totals as we do every day here, but there was some sunshine to be had into the afternoon. And of course, it warmed up quite nicely. So we had a little bit of everything, but I do want to walk you through this rain event because it is of note. For the next little while, we are going to be seeing some increasing clouds. So tomorrow morning, no need for the umbrella, but yeah, you probably won't need those sunglasses either. By the afternoon, this is going to be the start of what I would like to call us in for the long haul from essentially Thursday afternoon 
to really, honestly, Saturday afternoon. It's probably gonna be raining more often than not in that time. And it'll look like this map really isn't doing much because it's just steady waves of rain. And you can see this color on here, yellow, that means some of the heaviest rain is gonna be falling more so on Friday afternoon and getting into the evening. So when I walk you through some of the totals here, for the next 24 hours, if you were to look at this, it's not gonna be a lot. We're looking at maybe 10 to 20 millimeters. Nothing too crazy, but watch in the next 24 hours after that, suddenly you see colors on this map that you haven't seen in a while. There is the realistic potential here that parts of the lower mainland comfortably between 50 and 100 millimeters of rain falling over the next 24 hours. So keep that in mind. For tonight, we are still gonna be dealing with rain across portions of the province, including Haida Gwaii. That's just gonna be translated as snow far to the north. And when it comes to our overall five-day forecast, yeah, I alluded to the fact that we are gonna be dealing with this rain but it's gonna be very mild on Friday. Temperatures easily reaching 11. I wouldn't expect it to go too much higher than that. But hey, look at this. That's the potential for some mixing. Rain snow mix once again on Sunday because overnight lows are gonna be dropping back down to the freezing mark. What a wacky weather world, eh? A wacky weather world <laughs> indeed. Thanks, Brett. You're welcome. Okay, when you think about uh, indigenous art, you might think of welcome poles, plaques, or masks. But boats also play a role in their culture, and tonight we introduce you to an artist who's carving a traditional watercraft. The journey just as much about reviving his family's forgotten culture as it is about honoring his ancestors. My name is Pat Callahu. I'm a Métis artist and I build canoes and paddles, and now I'm building this uh, beautiful big York boat. A York boat is a huge plank boat, so it's made of planks, and they would have filled it full of fur and everything that the uh, Hudson Bay Company would want to get around, and you'd paddle it to get there and portage it between places. I've built canoes, so I've always been interested in boats, and then I saw um, my family records of my family in them and some pictures and stuff and I thought well what a great way to um, memorialize them and keep their memory alive and a uh, challenge too so I'm really interested in how it all went together. My name is Bridget Boronsky. I'm the Site and Visitor Experience Manager here at Fort Langley National Historic Site which is part of Parks Canada. When he came to meet with us, he, he brought with him an album that was um, kind of showing a bit of his um, family ties to the Hudson Bay, um, other projects that he'd worked on, and part of that meeting he was telling us um, how his ancestors had um, made uh, York boats and had, were, were Métis um, working for the Hudson Bay Company. <laughs> I have never seen an actual York boat anywhere in British Columbia, so um, the first one I'm actually seeing in person is the one that I'm making. So uh, the blacksmith down here made the nails, a whole bunch of nails for us for this, so all the ones that you're going to be able to see are the ones that he made. So what I'm doing is I'm actually, I put the, put the metal in there and heat it up. It's getting very hot. So you can see that I'm flattening the metal out, it's very hot. And I'm just going to drop it out now. It just pops out, and the nail's done. A keel came out of a building in Vancouver. Um, so it's a really old piece of wood from the 1800s. And uh, it was a beam, like a roof beam. And uh, we had to get it, it was much larger, so then we had to get it cut and then uh, milled down specially to fit our, for our keel that we needed. So. And look too, we're, it's coming from a, in a, a pictures and books too, in real life. That's the difference. Same when I make my cards, everyone, you can look at a picture and say, oh, that's kind of neat, right? When you see one in person, it's like, wow, that's amazing. And you look at the joinery and stuff, and or wooden nails, it's, it's not like people don't do things like that these days, right? <laughs> Harvey Weinstein's trial continued today in New York City. How a case that sparked the Me Too movement is changing the law in Canada. Next.
Jurors at the Harvey Weinstein trial are hearing from more witnesses called by the prosecution. The former producer has pleaded not guilty to charges that include rape and predatory sexual assault. The two women appearing at Weinstein's trial today aren't connected to the specific charges against him. Instead, they were called to bolster the prosecution's argument that Weinstein has a pattern of sexual abuse. The allegations against Harvey Weinstein helped usher in the Me Too movement. And women are increasingly coming forward with their own stories of sexual harassment. Diane Buckter tonight looks ahead to propose new federal legislation intend to combat it in the workplace here in Canada. She was a senior IT systems analyst, experienced and highly paid. Nowadays, Sarah is on a long-term disability leave. We're not identifying her because she says she was sexually harassed on the job. He would just grab me and put his arm on my shoulder uh, like this, you know, really close to here. And his face was so close to me and it got extremely uncomfortable. So I pushed him away. I said, no, what, what are you doing? She and says it was one of her bosses who got what, physical. And uh, that's not the worst part. They actually forced me back to work with him within two hours after I, I, I complained sexual harassment. She went to her union, no luck there either. Sarah ended up in hospital with anxiety and depression. Some sexual harassment cases feature famous names or big settlements, like the $100 million the RCMP paid to settle a class action harassment lawsuit. But there are countless lesser known cases in Canada. It is ubiquitous, it happens everywhere. Um, and um, in the wake of Me Too, there have been um, all sorts of surveys from every uh, type of workplace that you can imagine, and it's, it's rampant. Employment lawyer Janice Rubin was hired by CBC to investigate the Gameshi case. She says a new federal law is coming this year. The employer has to actually proactively look at the workplace and figure out where the risk is. Bill C-65 spells out new responsibilities for all federally regulated industries, such as communications, transportation, the public service, to prevent workplace violence and harassment. This has to be solved. This is an indicia of inequality. Um, these are old behaviors from an old type of workplace that still haven't disappeared. The Weinstein court case has already resulted in other victims in other workplaces coming forward. Now Canadian employers better get ready to prevent new cases from ever happening. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. The wife of former NBA basketball star Kobe Bryant has posted a heartbreaking tribute to her late husband and daughter Gianna, who both died in a helicopter crash on Sunday. On Instagram, she thanked the millions of people who have shown support for her family, adding, there aren't enough words to describe our pain right now. I take comfort in knowing that Kobe and Gigi both knew they were loved so deeply. The cause of the crash is still under investigation. Well, as vehicles go, this one isn't exactly a speedy Tesla. Why this Zamboni is the talk of Saanich next.
Thursday on the early edition, we'll hear about a report issued this week by the Broadcasting and Telecommunications Legislative Review Panel and what it means for the future of Canadian broadcasting and Canadian content. That's tomorrow on the early edition, beginning at 5 a.m. All right, it uh, looks like a Zamboni does everything an older Zamboni does, but with one key difference. New models at a sandwich, San, sandwich, not sandwich, recreation <laughs> center are electric and eco-friendly and also much quieter. Take a look. For, for us, it's just for sandwich. Um, you know, greenhouse gases is, um, and emissions is, is a big um, focus of ours. Uh, so going to electric was one of those ones that we, we certainly wanted to do right off the get-go um, and to be able to replace those fossil fuels um, here. Uh, the pricing is very similar, so it was really economical for us to be able to do that at this stage. It would be about 15% more to go uh, electric, uh, but you know, then we don't have to buy propane uh, every year, so you know, those, uh, those operating costs go down pretty quickly and, and you start to make your money back, uh, certainly within those 10 years with the batteries. Every year we uh, estimate that our Zamboni fleet, our two Zambonis uh, <laughs> overall, uh, drive the equal distance between Victoria and Halifax uh, every year uh, cleaning the ice. Being indoors, we would have to turn on the fans when, uh, usually when we had to, uh, when we fired it up, because you could smell exhaust. Uh, that's uh, the carbon monoxide and the nitrous oxide. So we're basically keeping, I think, six tons of, uh, of uh, emissions from getting into the atmosphere by using the electric. People were just a little more conscious of uh, their footprint, their carbon footprint and things like that. And especially when it's out on the ice 10, 15 times a day, you know, that it's, it's bringing down our, our emissions, a, a small part anyways. Makes the air Nicer in the ring, too. Yeah, a little more exactly. environmentally friendly. Yeah, they've been around for a while. But... Ic icing the gas, as producer Matthew likes to call icing it. Icing the gas. Putting the gas on ice, <laughs> just to be clear on that. All right. All right, from the uh, ice uh, to the garden, we're going to leave you tonight. So uh, look at this. Wow. It's not really the garden, but that's uh, the daffodils. It's spring. Are coming. It's, it, is it? <laughs> They're coming out in uh, English Bay there. Look at that. That's it for us tonight. Dan Burrow is here uh, after the National. Have a good night.